Welcome to lecture 11 of biology 116 entitled homeostasis. Now that we've gone through our ever expansive and ever so fascinating look at the large diversity of life, we're actually going to be changing our view of biology by now focusing on three main ideas. And these three main ideas will be seen for the duration of the next couple of lectures all the way until the end of the course. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at is number one, anatomy. Anatomy is going to be otherwise known as looking at the structure or the form of something. In addition, whenever you're looking at anatomy, a lot of people know anatomy goes hand in hand with physiology, and that's also what we're going to be uh, looking at in the next uh, set of lectures. So physiology is not about form or structure, but it's rather about function. So physiology is function, anatomy is form, think of them as form and function, structure and function, a big theme of biology as I've mentioned many, many times before. And then finally, a common denominator of anything in biology is its evolutionary backbone. Uh, evolution will also be hinted at and uh, discussed uh, uh, rather you know, explicitly or implicitly in many different ways as we're going through A and P throughout the next set of lectures. So these are the three main ideas to keep in mind. Anatomy, form, physiology, function, evolution, connection of everything in biology. And we'll look at that uh, at first from this homeostasis perspective. So in order to understand homeostasis, I think it's important to begin our look at this process uh, through an introductory flowchart entitled Introduction. So what is homeostasis? Let's hash out this definition uh, at the very, very beginning. What I want to do is break down the word. Homeostasis is going to uh, literally translate into steady state. That's what it literally means uh, from those two roots of homeo and stasis, steady state. But I want to break this down a little bit further. I'm going to tell you that the steady state that's achieved through homeostasis uh, is actually going to involve a couple of key factors. It's going to involve uh, this idea of maintenance. Uh, that's a big theme in homeostasis. Maintenance of what? Maintenance of uh, what is known as an internal balance. You have to remember that as complex organisms like you and I, uh, we have to maintain our internal environment uh, and compare that to the external environment uh, and see how we have a difference or a similarity or something that we have to uh, keep in mind as we're going through a homeostatic mechanism. Internal and external will be interrelated. What we want to do with the internal side is maintain that balance somehow, some way. And usually this maintenance is a very, very dynamic. Uh, it's a very ongoing process that continues. Uh, it never stops. Uh, and that's going to be the idea of it being steady, constantly happening. Uh, and in addition, Whenever we look at homeostasis, we have to understand something very critical is the fact that all living things, doesn't matter what, all living things, however complex or however simple, this is why this is the first anatomy and physiology topic we're talking about, all living things do something called regulate. That's another big word in homeostasis world. All living things regulate their internal conditions in some way. Again, we are separated from our external environment because we have internal structures. Those internal structures have internal conditions that need to be regulated in some way. How do we regulate them? That's all going to be through homeostasis. That's what that regulation comes from. So let's look at some examples of this regulation. Let's look at some examples of the steady state maintenance and dynamic homeostasis that we've been mentioning. Uh, in order to do that, we'll look at some basic homeostatic mechanisms. And these are really famous, you might have seen them before, and it's good to just recognize how they fall uh, on this look of homeostasis uh, as a whole. So basic homeostatic mechanisms. Uh, whenever we talk about homeostatic mechanisms, what we're trying to look at is the fact that we're uh, understanding and really dissecting something known as a feedback regulation. And in order to maintain homeostasis, uh, I just want to spell this correctly, uh, it's going to be achieved via some sort of feedback regulation. So that's another term that's new for us, feedback, and I'll just write REG for regulation. Feedback regulation is how we're going to maintain homeostasis. It's how we're going to maintain an internal balance. It's how we're going to regulate our internal conditions in some way. So what does this mean, feedback regulation? Basically, whenever we talk about feedback regulation, we have to understand two things. There's going to be a stimulus 
and that's usually from the external, the environment. Some sort of stimulus, uh, it hits us. And from there, we have to designate an appropriate response to that stimulus. Usually that response is going to be something internal that will again uh, balance out or counteract or maybe even promote that external stimulus. So think of this as the external, think of this as the internal, but there are two ways that this response can react or change this stimulus. The response may either increase the stimulus, so we'll put that over here, and I like to think of this as a positive feedback regulation, so we'll put a positive sign there, or what's the opposite? The response may decrease the stimulus, whatever that external stimulus was, that stimulus might decrease, and that's going to, of course, be known as negative feedback regulation. So positive and negative feedback regulations will either increase the stimulus, that's going to be the response, or they're going to decrease the stimulus that originally entered the system, and that's going to be a necessary response. So based off of this, we can now dissect this even further and look at the two types of feedback regulation we just established and give them a more formal understanding. So we have two types of feedback regulation. Remember, what are we regulating? The internal environment. How are we regulating it? Through a feedback mechanism that is a homeostatic mechanism. So the two types of feedback regulation that are most famous are, of course, negative feedback, which I'll do over here. This one is most common. Uh, this is what the majority of the homeostatic mechanisms within our bodies are going to utilize. And then less common, but still important, don't get me wrong, uh, is positive feedback, which we'll do over here. So we'll do negative feedback first. I'll give you a nice example, very common example that you're definitely familiar with. So remember, negative feedback, more common than positive feedback. Um, what is negative feedback? We've sort of hinted at it here and we have an idea, but basically what you just want to know about negative feedback is this is when you have a response to the stimulus. Remember, the stimulus comes from the external environment. Okay, We have a response to the stimulus that actually decreases. Okay, It decreases. I'm going to put this in big, bold, capital letters for you. It decreases. That's why it's negative feedback. Response to stimulus decreases that original stimulus. Whatever it was originally, it gets decreased. And I'll give you a nice, really common, really easy to understand example. So EX, for example, that will be exercise. So most of us have engaged in some sort of physical activity. Uh, and so what we notice uh, is the fact that whenever we do exercise, let's say, let's say we increase our exercise output, okay? We're running, we're working out, we're playing a sport, whatever it may be. Uh, we're trying to catch the bus. Any sort of increase in exercise is going to almost always be associated with an increase in heat, heat production. That's because we're breathing more, we're trying to make more ATP. And remember, cell respiration. If you do more cell respiration, you get more heat because heat is an output of cell respiration and therefore you have an increase in heat. An increase in heat means an increase in overall body temperature. We start to feel warmer and I think most of us are familiar with that fact. As we feel warmer, we are going to increase something known as, and sometimes we don't like this, but it's actually very important, increase our sweating. Sweating is otherwise known as a way to do evaporative cooling. So we actually increase what's known as evap, I'll just write evap for evaporative cooling. Are you getting the idea here right now? This word cooling is actually uh, in contrast to much of what we've just spoken about. So what does evaporative cooling do? Evaporative cooling is going to directly interact with one of these steps. It's actually going to directly interact with that increase in body temperature. What do you think a cooling evaporative effect is going to do to the body temperature? It's going to actually not increase it anymore, but of course, we are going to decrease the body temperature. And that's our negative feedback regulatory system. Take a look at what we did. What was our original stimulus that caused this? I'm going to say that the stimulus was maybe increase in exercise, maybe increase in heat, whatever. Let's say the, the stimulus was just the increase in body temperature. What was the response? The response was to decrease the body temperature. Look, response to stimulus, decrease stimulus, decrease the body temperature. Uh, and how did we do that? Via sweating. This is our negative feedback system. And exercise is a really good example of that. Just go through it again. 
notice that whatever the response is, we're trying to decrease the stimulus. We're trying to get cooler because the body's getting hotter. It's the exact opposite system that's happening here. That's a negative feedback system. And then finally, positive feedback. Uh, it's much the opposite, of course. It's less common, but it's still very important. And I'll show you a really important example as to where we see it. We'll just say that the response to the stimulus here doesn't decrease the stimulus, but what? It increases. So I'll write INC for increases the stimulus. Okay, so it's exact opposite here. What's our example? Classic example, some of you may be familiar with it already, is childbirth. So childbirth is a, is a, is a positive regulatory feedback system. It's a homeostatic mechanism. Uh, what happens in childbirth? Uh, to put it very, very simply, uh, let's go to the moment of childbirth. As childbirth is happening, there's going to be an increase of pressure that comes from the baby's head that's trying to exit. Okay, uh, during this birthing event. So the baby's head is pushing, and that's an increase of pressure uh, caused by that sort of push coming from the baby. In addition, this push is going to directly result in increased contractions. And the contractions are coming from mom. These increased contractions from mom are going to eventually promote birth. And I'll just really, really uh, simplify it by saying that we increase the likelihood and chance of birth. Lots of increasing going on here. I don't see any decreasing. What did I say? Response to stimulus is to increase the stimulus. What's the stimulus here? I'll say the stimulus is step one, increased pressure from the baby's head. What's the response? Increased contractions from the mom. What's the overall goal? We eventually get a higher likelihood, a more efficient output of the big moment of life known as birth. So this is, of course, uh, a little bit rarer than negative feedback, but overall, you get a good understanding of the two types of feedback regulations that we see in homeostasis. Notice and connect how each of these are about maintaining an internal balance, how they're dynamic in their nature, and how it's going to be very much a regulatory event occurring in both.